We're at one of the last Sunday night services where we're going through a book of the Bible. Um, we'll be looking at Jude, and I'm excited to share with you guys a fraction of what God has taught me from this book. I thought when I picked this book that it was going to be 25 verses and I would be able to take a different approach than the other books and go through it really quickly and go through it word for word and preach it like a normal sermon, not like an overview sermon. And that's been easier said than done. I decided to start this and kind of cheat a little bit and take my small group through this book. I think we're at verse 9, so that timing was a little off. And so we're going to start today and look at a little bit of background about the book, and then we're going to spend as much time as we can going through the details of this letter. Who is Jude? Open up your Bible if you have one. Um, if you don't, there's a couple of here that we would love to get to you. Um, open up your Bible to Jude. It's the second to last book of your Bible. Um, and looking at verse 1, the Bible tells us who Jude is. It says, Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. Jude is the brother of James. This James is the half-brother of Jesus. So Jude wrote this book as the half-brother of Jesus as well. But Jude sees his relationship with James as the defining characteristic of who he is. So when he says who he is, he says, I'm the brother of James. But then he says, I'm the slave of Jesus. And so when he defines the characteristic of what he's all about, it's in relationship to Jesus as his slave. To this crowd, Jude could have said, I'm the brother of Jesus and had status, but he didn't want that. Jude, the slave of Jesus, puts him in the proper place. It puts him in alignment, in the same boat, in the same battle as the people that he's speaking to in this book. This introduction, these few words, are like Jude is saying to his audience, I'm Jude, you know, James's brother. My relationship to Jesus has nothing to do with the household I grew up in, and everything to do with my service to him. So put Jesus on his throne and listen to my words. This book is eternally linked to 2 Peter. Jude was probably written a few, later, a few years later than 2 Peter. And if you look at 2 Peter, it's just three, three chapters, but you'll see that most of 2 Peter is devoted to the apostate. Ben did a great job of preaching this book a few weeks ago and, and really gave us an overview of what this means. Um, some scholars think 2 Peter was written to a group of Christians. We don't exactly know who. Um, and Jude is kind of the sequel to that letter, to the same group. These two books are very closely related. Peter says, get ready, it's coming, get ready, there are mockers, there are scoffers, there are false teachers, and they will come. In 1 Peter, or 2 Peter 3.3, 3, he says, know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come. They will come, Peter says, they will come. He describes them in chapter 2 in this very real, clear way. But again, it's in the future. Chapter 2, verse 1. False teachers also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. He looks back in the Old Testament, and they had false teachers and false prophets, and he says, they're going to come among you. Second Peter was likely written in 68 AD, before the destruction of Jerusalem. The Lord has been gone about 35 years at that point. Churches have been planted, and Peter is saying the false teachers are going to come, and they're going to secretly introduce destructive heresies. Jude is very close to this same period. I think Jude was written before the fall of and destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, so it's very close. But Jude's story is a little different. He says they're here. They are here. They have arrived. The mockers will come, is what Peter said. There will come false teachers. And Jude says they're here. Just a couple of years later. And the church needs to know that, and the church needs to be aware of that. And you cannot just accept 
everybody who says they're a Christian or a Christian teacher or a Christian theologian. The book of Jude is not redundant to 2 Peter. It's not a repetition. It's the fulfillment. The apostasy has begun. It's going to go and grow until the Lord returns. Peter speaks in future tenses. Jude speaks in present tense. And if you read carefully, you'll see that there's a lot of parallels in the two. So if you haven't already, open your books, your Bibles to Jude 2, or to Jude, and we will read it. Let's actually take a look at verse 3. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. See, Jude started to write a letter. He wanted to talk about salvation. And he was ready to write the letter. And he was excited about the gospel. And he was really ready to celebrate the wonders of the gospel with them. However, while he was making that effort, he was interrupted. And he said, I felt the necessity to write to you. Since we know now that this letter is part of the inspired word of God, we could read this better by saying, the Holy Spirit inspired me to change directions and make an appeal to you. I had some other things I wanted to talk about. I wanted to write you a positive letter, but I felt it necessary to write a letter under the compulsion of the Holy Spirit to engage you in the battle, in the fight, in the struggle, in the war against the faith. There's a war against the body of truth. We know, Christian, and this is the faith. And we need to engage in this, and I feel an urgency to change my approach and talk to you about this. This book has a high value for us today. Jude's words are strong. They were written to shock the audience, and today we need to be shocked as well. Not just for the Christian church broadly, which we can see apostates throughout the Christian church broadly. But we need these words for Grace Bible Church. Let's talk about GBC for a second. How do you pray for Grace Bible Church? What do you think the greatest risk to Grace Bible Church is? Do you think Grace Bible Church will come to an end because some sort of an organization from the outside will pick it and we will crumble under that? Do you think the government will decide to close the doors of Christ Bible Church and that's how it's going to end? Have you ever thought about something like that happening? Honestly, I haven't. That's never crossed my mind. We don't because we all know the greatest threats to GBC don't come from the inside or outside. They come from the inside. The real threats come from people within who name the name of Christ or once named the name of Christ and are now the enemies of Christ. They once affirmed their trust in God, belief in God, and affirmed the scripture and have now come to be enemies of scripture. They're on the inside. When I think about the churches I've been to in my life, which has not been that many, the ones that are no longer around had in some way fallen away from the truth of the scripture. Some false doctrine crept in some place and it spread. It's made it, it made its way to the leadership level of that church and by God's grace, he chose to close the doors to those churches. There are some that are far worse because they're still around. They've wavered from the truth and they are growing. False doctrine crept in unnoticed and these churches are bringing destruction to the Christian community. Let's look at verse 4. Certain persons have crept in unnoticed. And then if you look down to the lower part of the page, it says, these men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feasts when they feast with you without fear. They're on the inside. They are deadly dangerous because they bring such devastating corruption from their position and their posture inside the church. So what is this book all about? 
Jude calls the Christian to two all-consuming responses to protect themselves from the unfathomable destruction that hidden apostates can bring in the church. Let me give you my outline tonight really quickly, and then we'll work our way through it. My outline starts with a command. We must contend earnestly for the faith. And then we will spend much of our time tonight talking about the unfathomable destructiveness of hidden apostates. And we'll close tonight with the other command, keep yourselves in the love of Christ. Before I break this down, I want to remind you that this letter is sent specifically to a group of Christians for a specific purpose to protect themselves from a specific attack. However, Jude understands that these apostates are not unique to this group. In verse 14, he makes references or reference to these men as being judged in the return of Christ. He has the future in mind here and knows that these men are not unique to his audience. We're a group of Christians that need to hear how we can protect ourselves from the exact same kind of attack. God preserved this book with a purpose for Grace Bible Church. The direct application to a small church in Tempe is striking. So Christian, Jude calls you to two all-consuming responses to protect yourselves from the unfathomable destruction of hidden apostates. They are hidden apostates at Grace Bible Church. Let's respond well. Look at verse 3 again. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I found, felt the necessity to write to you exhorting that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. That is a strong verb, contend earnestly. To agonize, to fight, to struggle, to battle, to give great effort, to give great exertion. He added the Pre prefix preposition and intensified it. And it's a good translation. Contend earnestly, battle, battle mightily, struggle powerfully for the faith. The faith being the body of truth. The word is objective. It is objective faith. And Jude says, it's here and the truth is at stake and you need to join the force of those who would contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. That's the biblical thing, faith. This is really a brief statement. Jude doesn't spend any time telling us how to contend for the faith. He tells us that it is faith handed down to the saints. But what's on his mind, what I think he's focusing on, is these apostates. He really wants us to understand a lot about these apostates. He gets there quickly, and so we will too. We're going to talk about the unfathomable destruction of hidden apostates. If you look at the pronouns of, these book, of this book, there are basically two characters. There's the Christian, and there's the apostate. We've discussed the Christian some so far. It's the same group that was written in Two in Second Peter, and Ben did a great job of breaking down that audience in his letter. What we should know is these are believers that have a deep understanding of the Old Testament. They also understand First and Second Peter, and likely some of the writings of Paul. And Jude really leans on that understanding that they know the Old Testament, and he references it quite a bit. And then there's the apostate. I'll be using that word a lot tonight to describe the men described in verses 4 through 19. I think that word describes them well. It's a one-word encapsulation of 19 verses. And so tonight, as we discuss it, we're going to walk through kind of five steps that Jude lays out. We're going to start in verse 4 and look at the introduction of the apostate. Then we're going to look at the historical fate of the apostate in 5 through 7. We'll see the conduct of the apostate in 8 through 11 in verse 16, the character of the apostate in 12 and 13, and the prophesied end of the apostate in 14 and 15. Like I said, this section is riddled with Old Testament references, 
A deep knowledge of each reference clarifies what Jude is trying to communicate, so we will spend most of our time tonight looking at these references and trying to understand exactly what Jude wants to communicate here. So let's look at the introduction of the apostate in verse 4. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. These crept in unnoticed. They look like Christians in some way. They know the gospel. It says that they turn the grace of God into sensuality, and if you want to turn the grace of God into anything, you have to understand it. And so they have a working understanding of the gospel and can articulate it. I believe these men are trying to intentionally cause havoc in the church, but they could just be unconverted and do not see the truth. These men were never transformed by the gospel. And Jude says they won't be. That's a bold statement to make about anybody. But Jude does not have a place in his mind for trying to win these people. When he calls them, quote, long beforehand marked out for condemnation, he is referencing God not selecting them for salvation. This is a Jacob I loved, Esau I hated situation. And Jude sees their destruction and says that from the beginning of time, they are headed to judgment. And then he says that they pervert the gospel in gross ways. There are two ways they pervert the gospel here. They turn it into sensuality and they deny Jesus. These are gross men and Jude has strong words for them. Now let's look at the historical fate of the apostate. Jude gives the Christians three striking illustrations. If you thought calling them out as marked for condemnation was bad, wait till you see where he goes next. Let's read verses 5 through 7. Now I want to remind you, though you know all things, that Jesus, having once saved a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their abode, he, Jesus, has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them having indulged in the same way as these, I believe these is referencing the apostates, having indulged in the same way as these in gross sexual immorality and having gone after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Jude gives us three illustrations as examples of God's judgment, and I think it's important for us to review these one at a time. Turn with me to Exodus 14. Exodus 14 Starting in verse 4, we're going to talk about the example of the unbelieving Israel. Thus, I will harden Pharaoh's heart with strength, and he will pursue them. And I will be glorified through Pharaoh, this is God talking, and all his army, so that the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. And they did so. Then the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people, and they said, What is this we have done, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot ready and took his people with him, and he took six hundred choice chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. In the next couple of verses, we see Israel in unbelief and fear. And then picking up in verse 13, it says, But Moses said to the people, Do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of Yahweh, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians, whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Yahweh will fight for you, and you will keep silent. And then going down to verse 21, 
Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Yahweh swept the sea back by the strong east wind all night and made the sea into dry ground, so the waters were split. So the sons of Israel went through the midst of the sea on the dry land, and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And then the Egyptians pursued them. And all of Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen, went in after them into the midst of the sea. Then at the morning watch, Yahweh looked down on the camp of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud and brought the camp of the Egyptians into confusion. And he caused their chariot wheels to swerve, and he made them drive with difficulty. So the Egyptians said, let us flee from Israel, for Yahweh is fighting for them against the Egyptians. Then Yahweh said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters may come back over the Egyptians, over their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak, while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then Yahweh overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them, not even one of them remained. But the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall to them on the right and on their left. Thus Yahweh saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Then Israel saw the great hand which Yahweh had used against the Egyptians, and the people feared Yahweh, and they believed in Yahweh and in his servant Moses. There are a couple of things that I want to notice in this passage thought it was important to read that much of the passage because we got to see something about God. In those 17 verses, God was referenced 15 times. God was in complete control of every single step. And that passage tells us what God's purpose was. If you look back at verse 4, it says, I will be glorified through Pharaoh and all his army so that the Egyptians will know that I am Yahweh. And then verse 31 says, Then Israel saw the great hand which Yahweh had used against the Egyptians, and the people feared Yahweh, and they believed in Yahweh and his servant Moses. The enemies know that he is Yahweh, and Israel knows that he is Yahweh. God's purposes were to make himself known. This is a helpful reminder God has a purpose with the apostate as well. God hasn't changed. He wants to make himself known. He's going to do that today just like he did that with Moses. Now let's move on to the example of the fallen angels. Verse 6. In mid-February, Smed did a great job of breaking down what Jude is talking about here. The sermon was on the fifth trumpet from Revelation 9, verses 1 through 12. And I really would encourage you to listen to that sermon. It's really helpful, and I'm just going to gloss over a lot of what he says. Um, As I've studied this, I mean, not to say anything different, but reading this, I'm in 100% agreement with Smed's interpretation of these passages. I think he just did a great job of laying it out. Let's turn to Genesis 6 and see what the Bible says there. Genesis 6, starting in verse 1. Now it happened, when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were good in appearance. And they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. And then Yahweh said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he indeed is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. And when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, 
from man to animals to creeping things to the birds of the sky, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. These verses say exactly what they sound like they say. We have men and we have daughters born to men. We have another group called sons of God. Throughout the Old Testament, sons of God is used to describe angels. And that's exactly what we have here, but not just angels. We have wicked angels. And it says that these angels, these demons, cohabit with human women and produce a half-breed offspring of supernatural men, of renowned beings that are demigods with superpowers. They're half-demon, half-human, and that's what this text says. Like I said, I love Smed's explanation of this, and I don't want to re be redundant, but I do think it's important to see how big of a deal this is. Satan's attack was on the seed line of humanity, and God's response was in verse 7. I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land. But Noah found favor in the eyes of Yahweh. This is an abomination of God's created order, and he destroyed almost all of mankind because of it. Can you think of a sexual sin today that might be an abomination of God's created order? I know I can. Now let's move on to the examples of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the last example Jude gives us, and it comes from Genesis 19. So just turn your Bible a couple of pages to the right. We'll look at Genesis 19 together. We know the story. Yahweh was speaking with Abraham, and he spent, sent two angels to look at the city for anyone worth saving, and they came to Lot's house. Lot took them in and tried to protect them from the men of the city, but the angels seemed to be able to take care of themselves. So let's read Genesis 19, starting in verse 10. But the men... The men here is actually a reference to the two angels I just mentioned. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them. The, them is the gang of the Lot that met, met out, front of, out in front of Lot's house. So he brought them into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, from small to great, so that they wearied themselves just trying to find the doorway. And then the two men said to Lot, Whom else have you here? A son-in-law and your daughters and your sons and everyone you have in the city. Bring them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place, because their outcry has become great before Yahweh. So Yahweh has sent us to destroy it. Now at the breaking of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, I jumped down to verse 15 there. Now the breaking of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, lest you, swept away in the, lest you be swept away in the punishment of the city. But Lot hesitated. So the men seized his hand and the hand of his wife and the hands of his two daughters, for the compassion of Yahweh was upon him. And they brought him out and put him outside of the city. And then in verse 24, it says, And Yahweh rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from Yahweh out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. And then his wife from behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. Now Abraham arose early in the morning and went to the place where he stood before Yahweh. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he saw... And behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace. Thus it happened when God destroyed the cities of the valley, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, and when he overthrew the cities in which Lot lived. These men from 10 and 11 were going after some sort of sexual immorality with the angels. Again, perverse sexual immorality, unimaginable, and that was destroyed by God. Jude gives us three examples. Israel, fallen angels, and Sodom and Gomorrah. And these examples should shock us. 
this apostate will suffer the same fate. Judgment from God. If I think through the most extreme sin and most extreme examples in Scripture, I can't come up with much better than what Jude put here. That's the weight he gives to handling this apostate. That's the destructiveness of this apostate. This, that is how important it is to God that this apostate is dealt with. So how does the apostate act? What is the conduct of the apostate? Let's look, go back to Jude and look at verse 8. Jude 8 says, Yet in the same way these men. What does in the same way refer to? He looks back at the historical fate and says these men are just like them. The three examples of unbelieving Israel, fallen angels, and Sodom and Gomorrah had a fate of destruction. They indulged in sin, left what they should not have left, and rejected what they should not reject. They fed their sinful desires in the same way. In the same way, these men also, by dreaming, defile the flesh and reject authority and blaspheme glorious ones. But Michael, the archangel, when he, disputing with the devil, was arguing about the body of Moses, he did not dare pronounce against him a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. But these men blaspheme the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, and for, for pay they have poured themselves into the era of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. How do these men conduct themselves? There's four ways. Four ways that the apostates conduct themselves from Jude 8. The first one is, they're dreamers. This is like one that sees visions. And this word that is basically one that sees visions is used negatively as false prophecy. One commentator puts it like this. These individuals were claiming divine revelation as the basis of their practices, either because their visions gave them superior status in general or because the content of the visions was a rival revelation. Jude is referring to them as false prophets in that they claim prophetic basis for their practices. And Jude accuses these people of acting on the basis of their personal revelation and engaging in three sinful activities, defiling their bodies, rejecting authority, and blaspheming celestial beings or angels. So what does he mean by defile the flesh? While this exact phrase is only found outside of Scripture, it was used there like adultery or debauchery. The idea of defilement is frequently used for sexual actions of fallen angels or of the sodomites. Thus, Jude is clearly accusing them of unspecified defiling sexual practices. That is the same level as that of the fallen angels and the sodomites. I think if we go with the worst sexual sin you should never imagine, we're on the right track for what he's, he's describing here. And then he says they reject authority. More literally, they disregard lordship. This most likely means that these people deny the authority of Jesus, and this was a practical denial. They didn't deny the, the theology. They just didn't live their life as a life that's been transformed by the gospel. They disregarded the lordship of Christ. And then lastly, they blaspheme glorious ones. They slander the glorious ones. Who are the glorious ones? Angels. Why would they slander angels? I think there's something deeper here in that they're, they're actually blaspheming God's created order. They look at what God created and are saying, no, that's not right. I can't think of anyone that blasphemes God's created order these days. Oh, wait. No, I can't. 
I think verse 9 is so interesting. Verse 9, when he talks about the archangel Michael. And so I want to talk about Michael a little bit. Um, Turn with me to Daniel 12. It's sword drill night. Sorry. Daniel 12. Jude, in Jude, he describes Michael the archangel, the chief angel of God who watches over Israel. We learned about that in Daniel when Smed walked us through that. And he leads the holy angels in Revelation 12. But here in Daniel 12, there's something interesting I want to look at. So look at just Daniel 12, verse 1. Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will stand. And there will be a time of distress such as never happened since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book, will be rescued. Michael the archangel will stand guard over the people. Michael has great strength. Many would call him the most powerful being in the created order. Look at Revelation 12 with me. Revelation 12, starting in verse 7. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. This is a picture of Michael waging war against Satan and winning. This is who Michael is. If I were to create an example of someone who could rebuke Satan with his own power, it would be Michael. But in Jude 9, it says that Michael did not use his own power, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Talking about Moses' death, and we know from Deuteronomy that God buried Moses, and we don't know where Moses' body is. And this story gives us a little glimpse into something that, that, frankly, we didn't know about anywhere else in Scripture. But it was that there was some sort of a dispute between Michael and Satan about Moses' body. And in that dispute, Michael won. And he didn't say out of his own power that he won. But he said, the Lord rebuke you. That's significant. Jude has a purpose for this illustration. Michael is considered by many as the most powerful angel. Michael has shown power from God in ways no one else on earth has. And Michael has some sort of disagreement with Satan over the burial of Moses. And Michael relied on God's power and authority to respond. How proud are we when we try to resist sin out of our own power? or condemn sin out of our own power. Let's keep reading in Jude. I hope you've kept your finger there, because I keep moving you around. In Jude, verse 10, it says, But these men blaspheme the things they do not understand, and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them. For they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have poured themselves into air like Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These men act with such boldness. Cain, acting sinfully and selfishly in his worship of God, quote, worship of God. Balaam, without turning to Numbers 31, it says, through the word of Balaam, Israel acted unfaithfully against Yahweh. And then Korah, once again, This is in Numbers 16. It says, Korah rose up before Moses, and together with some of the sons of Israel, he turned Israel against Yahweh. Once again, their fate was destruction. These men turned people of God against their leadership and against God. That's how they conducted themselves. That's what this apostate conducts himself with. This is a scary place to be. And that's the conduct of the apostate. 
Now let's look at his character. We've seen that these men go unnoticed. They have a fate of destruction, and their conduct is abhorrent. But what are they like? These men, verse 12, who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear, carrying for themselves clouds without water, carried along by winds, autumn trees without food or without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. We've already seen a little bit about their character. They join their church's grill outs and they fellowship as if they're believers, but they don't operate the same way as the rest of the body. A hidden reef doesn't stand out to the captain, but it can cause all sorts of destruction. But Jude, can you describe their character? Yeah, yeah, they care for themselves. They're like clouds without water, autumn trees without fruit, waves of the sea, wandering stars. Jude is showing us that these men are not actually creating any fruit in their ministry. They do a lot, but nothing of value comes from it. What are the purposes of our relationships with each other? We know this. From Ephesians 4, the body causes the growth of the body. We fellowship. We live out the one another's with each other. We bear one another's burdens. And there's fruit that comes from this. But Jude gives us four metaphors, all from nature, to for, show us four different ways these men do things and produce nothing. They're just focusing on themselves. Their character is selfishness. So let's finish up this section by looking at the prophesied end of the apostate in verse 14 and 15. But Enoch... In the seventh generation from Adam also prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These verses present an interesting interpretive question. Where's the prophecy of Enoch? Enoch is mentioned in Genesis 5, and Jude's reference to the seventh generation of Adam fits the genealogy there, but there's no mention of this prophecy in the Bible. To answer this question comes in the answer of how do we deal with texts that are referenced in Scripture but are not part of our Bible. This quote is actually from the Greek translation of the first book of Enoch. It's 1 Enoch 1.9. This book is referenced regularly in Jude's day, and in fact, there are more references to the Nephilim there, as well as some interesting descriptions about things that we see in Jude. However, if you read it, and I happen to go down that rabbit trail this week, it doesn't read like the inspired word of God. It was actually kind of interesting. It, it felt more like I was reading the Book of Mormon than I was reading a book of the Bible. If you want to be confident in the inspiration of your Bible, read the book of Enoch. It just reads so differently. However, at the time of Jude, he clearly felt that at least parts of it were true, and so he quoted it directly. One commentator mentioned that the way the book of Jude was referenced among New Testament writers shows that they elevated it above much other literature but did not put it in the same category as the Old Testament scriptures or even the writings of the apostles. And within about 200 years of the writing of this book, the book of Enoch had fallen into discredit and was pretty much out of circulation. So what do we do with this prophecy? And the answer is quite simple. We take it as scripture because it is in scripture. Just because the source is not inspired does not make the statement untrue. Song lyrics are often quoted in Scripture without the source, but we read right through it as Scripture. This quote gets a reference, so sometimes we get hung up on the reference, but the second this quote was put in the letter, it became part of the inspired Word of God. So what is the prophecy? God will execute judgment on ungodly men. This is both not surprising 
and very comforting. God will execute judgment on ungodly men. What was Jude trying to communicate to his Christian audience? These men are under the judgment of God. So we've learned a lot about these apostates. In verse 4, we learned that they crept in among us unnoticed and perverted the gospel and the deity of Christ. In verses 5 through 7, we learned that these apostates will suffer the same fate, or fate on parallel with the worst fates described in all of Scripture. In 8 through 11, we learned that their conduct pardons sexual sin, ignores Christ's lordship, and discredits God's created order. In verses 12 and 13, we learn their character bears no fruit, and we just saw that they're destined for God's judgment. I don't know about you, but if you did not include the two phrases, unnoticed among you or hidden reefs, I would think there's no way someone like this could be a Grace Bible Church. I think there's two ways for us to take these verses and really this entire book. We could think the magnitude of what is happening in, within Jude's audience is unique to that audience, and so let's just ignore it. Or option B, recognize that we don't hold the spiritual significance of sin with the right magnitude. Put another way, sin is so much worse than we like to think. There are men in their church that go unnoticed. They misrepresent scripture, they bring their own version of things to the table. They participate in sexual sin in ways that rival the sodomites. They reject the authority and lordship of Jesus in their lives, and they blaspheme the created order. They turn people against God-ordained leadership. This is a big deal. And this can happen at Grace Bible Church, right? What if you run into someone who's addicted to pornography and hides it, or someone that's sleeping with their girlfriend, someone who's having an affair, someone who ignores the details of the creation ac account and listens to evolutionary theory, someone who believes scripture is insufficient and relies on psychology, someone who convinces you not to listen to scripture, someone who tr causes you to not trust the leadership God has put in place, this text should not live in the abstract for you. We need to think about it today. There are people like this at Grace Bible Church. And so what do we do? I'm glad you asked. Jude answers that. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God. I'm going to read 17 through 23. But you, beloved, must remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ that they were saying to you, in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourself up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And on some who are doubting, have mercy. For others, save, snatching them out of the fire. And on others, have mercy with fear, hating even the tunic polluted by the fresh flesh. These verses are the exact answer to what do we do. Verses 17 through 19 tell us to be on the alert for the apostate. We saw earlier that this person is completely selfish in their interactions and they cause divisions. Do you find yourself feeling divided from members or leadership of Grace Bible Church? Be on the alert for those that planted a seed of doubt. They're worldly minded and there's so many ways we can allow ourselves to be worldly minded. But are there people among you that tempt you in that direction? Be on the alert. And then in 20 and 21, he tells us to have a ready defense. Jude tells us to keep ourselves in the love of God and gives us three practical ways to do that. Build yourself up in the most holy faith. Or put another way, shepherd your heart. Pray in the Holy Spirit and wait on the mercy of Jesus Christ. Think eternally. Notice how the defense is about you protecting your own heart in prayer, in the word, 
and looking outside of yourself at the eternal mercy of Christ. But then Jude's so gracious because he tells us how to look outward and how to care for the others in the body too. So Christian, help others. Here we are at the end of this book, and frankly, these two verses are the two verses that brought me to this book in the first place. When I said dibs on Jude, it was because of Jude 22 and 23. If you're working hard to build yourself up, if you're in prayer and you're focusing on eternity, then you are equipped to help someone else. You need to help someone else from being lured by the apostate. And there's three stages to being lured. There are the doubters, there are those that are deceived, and there are those that are committing sin. The doubters are maybe questioning the truth of Scripture, and they need mercy and grace to be shown where the apostate is causing divisions. The deceived person is heading in the wrong direction, but has not yet responded to the apostate with sin. So we need to be firm, but gentle and clear. And then there is one who has been polluted by the flesh and is acting out in sin that the apostate has enticed them to. And this person must be shown this letter. They must be shown how grievous sin is. It is the merciful thing to do to confront sin. And so he says, have mercy with fear. The fear of what the eventual outcome could be if they don't turn from their way. I want to close tonight with a bookend. Verses 1 and 2 and 24 and 25 are the most important part of this letter because it talks about God. I'm going to read those four verses together. Jude, a slave of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. And then in 24, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Who is that? That's God. Now to God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God called us, God kept us. This is a scary book, Christian, but you're kept in Christ Jesus. What is God's role in all of this? He keeps us from stumbling. He will make us stand in his glory blameless. He is to be glorified. Remember the story we talked about of Moses. Every step of that story was orchestrated by God. The Israelites didn't have faith to trust God yet, but he was showing them something about what they should do and why they should do it. When you see things at Grace Bible Church that cause you concern, you can trust God too. And that's so sweet. It's so sweet to know that God kept us and will keep us. Let me close our time in prayer. Lord God, this letter so needed. Lord, there is not a church on the planet that is protected from having sin amongst it. Lord, and so we look at this letter and we pray and we ask your help for us to see where there's sin, where sin needs to be confronted, where we can protect ourselves, how we are to interact with each other. Lord, help us to keep a watch over ourselves. Lord, thank you for your word and for how you teach us through it. Lord, help us to serve you well this week, Lord, in your name. Amen.